from the book of Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 to 9, and this is from the New International Version, the Transfiguration. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The words of our Lord written for us. Okay, here's a, here's a pop quiz. Let's see who can identify the superhero in disguise. Clark Kent was really... Superman. What baffles me is how by taking off his glasses, Lois Lane could never figure it out. Okay. So Bruce Banner was really? Oh. Oh. Hulk, yeah. The choir knew that right off. I don't know why. Okay. Bruce Wayne. Batman. Or the Dark Prince, depending on your generation. Okay. Diana Prince. Oh. All right. We got a, we've got an Amazon yeah. thing going back here. Donald Blake. Oh, no 21st century. Uh, four. Four. Okay. One more. King T'Challa. The Black Panther. Yes. Okay. We can tell who's got grandchildren in the room. Here's a tough one. Jesus of Nazareth is really... You know, that's the most important question you're ever going to answer. When Jesus calmed the storm, the disciples were asking, who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? And when he cast out demons, the Pharisees asked, by what authority is he doing this? And when the disciples of John the Baptist came, um, they asked him, are you the one who we are expecting, or should we wait for another? And when he taught, the crowds were amazed because he taught them like one who had authority, not like their scribes. And when Jesus healed the leper, he actually told the man, don't tell anybody, just go to the priest and get a clean certificate of, of, uh, of uh, health. And it drove his brothers crazy. In the Gospel of John, chapter 7, they are advising Jesus. They say, oh, for goodness sake, you've got to go to Jerusalem and do some miracles if you're ever going to be famous. And even the devil got exasperated with Jesus. He said, turn these, bread, this, these stones into bread, he said. Prove that you're the miracle man. Jump off the pinnacle of the temple. Prove that you are somebody special and that God has given you superpowers. Let me make you rich and famous, the devil offered, and you can be a number one influencer. So why wouldn't Jesus just call a press conference and announce, I'm the one you've been waiting for. I am the Messiah. I have finally arrived. Because there were a lot of other famous, famous people operating in the public sphere around the same time in the same space. There was a man called Bar Kokhba who had a huge following, who was another claimant to be the Messiah. There were magicians doing miracles in the marketplaces. And so in today's scripture, 
where Jesus goes up on the mountain with only three of his disciples and his glory is revealed. The word glory in the Bible doesn't, it, it is sometimes described as a dazzling light, but the root of the word means weight or something that is density, dense. And the way you can picture it is after the resurrection, when Jesus walked into a locked room, the way to think of it is that not that Jesus is the ghost who walks through solid walls, but that Jesus is the solid where everything else is just vapor next to him. God is solid. So in today's scripture, where God's glory is revealed, why does he only bring three of his disciples? And who could possibly think that was a good marketing strategy? It tells us three things about Jesus. And one of them is a story you've probably heard before. A doctor, a lawyer, a little boy, and a priest were out on a Sunday afternoon flight in a small private plane. The plane develops engine trouble in spite of the best efforts the, the plane starts to go down the pilot grabs a parachute yells to the passengers uh, that they'd better jump and he bails out and unfortunately there's only three parachutes remaining the doctor grabs one says i'm a doctor i save lives." grabs the parachute jumps out the lawyer says i'm a lawyer and the lawyers are the smartest people in the world grabs a parachute and he jumps out the priest looks at the little boy and says, my son, I've lived a long and full life. You have your whole life ahead of you. You take the last parachute and jump. The little boy hands the parachute back to the priest and says, not to worry, father, the smartest man in the world just took off with my backpack. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew 24, 23, Jesus said, a day is going to coming when people are going to say, look, the messiah is over here look he's over there and he says don't believe everybody who says that they're somebody i keep getting messages on social media i think this week i've heard from a brain surgeon a prince from nigeria generals in the american army who are all in love with my profile and want to be my friend <laughs> should i be flattered and want to be friends you know, the first thing that we learn from Jesus, ironically, is to be discriminating in our faith and to be very careful, even maybe even a little bit skeptical about where we put our faith, especially when somebody makes a big deal out of telling us who they are. Because when somebody is somebody, they don't have to tell anybody that they're somebody because anybody who is anybody is going to figure it out. Did you follow that? Yeah. Woo! Jesus knows who he is. And anyone whose heart is genuinely open to God is going to find themselves drawn to him. And you can check him out. You can ask hard questions. You can check his references. You can examine the evidence for the resurrection. And I want to say, objectively speaking, the evidence for the resurrection is huge. I mean, just 20 years after the resurrection, the Apostle Paul writes that there are 500 eyewitnesses still living, presumably people you could go to on the street and ask for yourself who had seen Jesus alive after his execution by the Romans. There's more evidence, but that's not where I'm going today. Look at what the majority of historians and scholars have agreed on always. There's something about that guy that stands up to very close scrutiny. If anyone asks you to step into something by blind faith, you're not blind. God leads us by feelings, but also by understanding and by action. God stands up to close scrutiny. And meanwhile, up on the mountain, the disciples who are there with Jesus, the three, the three close ones, Peter, James, and John, they know the story of Moses that we heard read this morning. And when the, they knew that when Moses went up the mountain, that the glory of the Lord settled on top of that mountain and covered it for six days as a cloud. And on the seventh day, God called to Moses out of that cloud. 
We know that when Moses came down from that mountain again, his face was so radiant from the glory that he had absorbed that he had to wear cloth over his face so he wouldn't blind people. It faded over several days. And when Jesus' disciples realize they are seeing a reenactment of Mount Sinai where the glory of God, the presence of God is right there, they are terrified. Because in the Old Testament, Whenever human beings came into direct contact with the glory cloud, they die because there is a conflict. Have any of you done pottery, ceramics? You know, when there's a little flaw in the clay and you, heat, you put it into the kiln, what happens? It blows up. And in, in a way, it's like that with our own flawedness, our own sinfulness in direct contact with the, the holiness of God. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. <laughs> and like imperfections of pottery, when it goes to the kiln, it's destructive to people. But in Jesus, the glory cloud had come down to them and they did not die because Jesus had the ability to mediate that gap between human sinfulness and flaw and the holiness of God so that we can be in the presence of God and live. Exodus 33, Moses says, shone for days and then it faded. But Jesus' face and clothes were not reflecting glory. They were emanating glory. They were the source of glory. It came from him. It's as if Jesus was the sun and Moses was just the moon that reflected the light of the sun. And so Peter, who always has something to say, he wants to honor Jesus as one of the greatest and of the greatest of the greatest prophets and leaders and servants of God, along with Moses and Elijah. And Peter offers to build three shelters for the big three. And Matthew tells us that while Peter was still speaking, he got interrupted. A voice came from the cloud speaking. And the voice spoke and said, just like Mount Sinai, but the voice said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. In other words, one of these three is not like the others. C.S. Lewis said, a man who was nearly a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher or a great prophet or a great leader or a great servant of God. He said, a man who said the kind of things that Jesus said well, what did Jesus say? He said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. He said, the Father and I are one. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He said, my son, your sins are forgiven. Anyone who said the sort of things that Jesus said, C.S. Lewis says, would either be a lunatic on the level of someone who claims that they are a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. A person who says things like that is either mentally deranged or they're a liar. Lewis said, you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else he's a madman, or else he's something worse. You can shut him up as a fool, you can spit on him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He did not leave that option open to us. He did not intend to. And Peter had had the answer in his head before he went up on the mountain. He'd already declared once that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God. But you know, you can believe something up here mentally without it ever having reached here in the place that you live. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them. He said, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. 
for us, for you and for me, when it comes down to how we navigate our lives in the real situations that we face, this question that really matters is, who is Jesus really? And was he raised from the dead? What is different if Jesus is not just a human being, not just a Marvel superhero, is that if Jesus is who he says he is, and if he was raised from the dead, there is nothing that can happen to you that will not be made right in the end. About eight years ago, uh, sorry, Doug, I didn't get your permission to tell the story this time, but I'll ask for forgiveness after. But eight years ago, Doug needed some significant surgery. And so we went into Civic Hospital and uh, I was sitting in the waiting room and the doctor talked to us before. He said, it's about a 45 minute surgery, but if there are complications, maybe 90 minutes tops. And so 45 minutes, the doctor didn't come out. That's no surprise. 90 minutes, the doctor didn't come out. That's okay, there's a bit of a delay. Meanwhile, two hours, two hours and 30 minutes, I am calming myself. I'm reading my daily devotional reading. The reading that day was the one that says, in those days, there were many, in the days of Elijah, there were many widows in Israel. <laughs> I thought that's not really comforting. <laughs> Pretty much everyone who'd started in the waiting room had had the doctor come out to them, say they're in recovery now, not me. So I went to talk to the receptionist, said, is there any word? Can you phone in? She phoned in. She said, there's nothing I can tell you. Two hours and a half. I'm getting texts from the kids. I'm getting texts from my friends. I'm getting texts from people in the church. Is he out yet? Is everything okay? I don't know what to tell them. I keep going to the receptionist. By this time, everybody in the waiting room knows that I'm the person who doesn't know what's happening and they're not telling me anything. And I tell you, I've sat in that waiting room with other families often enough to know that is not good news. Three hours and 45 minutes later, the doctor comes into the waiting room. He does not tell me everything's okay. He's in recovery. He asks me to come into the consulting room in private. Everyone in the waiting room knows what that means. And all the time, kids are messaging, friends are messaging, and I have been trying to control my emotions for hours. I say, I'm not going to lose it on the basis of what I don't know has happened. But my rational brain is thinking, should I phone the kids or should I drive into Toronto to take the, to tell them in person? Where should, what funeral home should I call? Who's going to take the service? By the way, he survived. You probably guessed that already. <laughs> but it wasn't evident at the time, I can tell you. And I'm saying, and I'm saying, Lord, at this moment, I don't know if I'm a widow or not. And as distinctly as can be, it was as if God said in my mind, what is it to you? And I thought, what? If that's you, God, that's no better than the scripture I was reading today. And in that very deeply emotional moment, I had a clear sense of God speaking to me and saying, if things don't work out the way you want them to work out, will you still trust me? Will you still love me? Will you still serve me? And I thought, where else am I going to go? Because if Jesus really is the glory of God, if Jesus really is the resurrection and the life, in the end, in the end, it's okay. 
Because as Romans 8 says, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come can ever separate us from the love of God, which is ours in Christ Jesus. Everything, everything hinges on who Jesus is. This Wednesday, we're going to have an Ash Wednesday service. It's really interesting. Lent is set up with the reminder of our mortality. We have ashes put on our head in the sign of the cross. As a reminder that everything we are, everything we love, everything we cherish in this world is mortal. And if we put our hope and trust in it, we'll be disappointed because nothing we love will last except one. But if we put our hope and our trust in Jesus Christ, he is forever. And he will restore all things. And he has never let you down. And if he is who he says he is, and you belong to him, you're going to be okay. He will get you through no matter what. Sometimes he calms the storm, and sometimes the storm just keeps raging, and he calms you in the midst of it instead. But he is able. And at some point in your life, many of you have been there already. And if you haven't yet, you will be. You will come into a place where what you have believed is forced into a choice between whether you have to discard it or intellectualize it or whether it takes that 14 inch journey to here where it makes an impact on how you're living your life. And it is the best journey you will ever take. Sometimes the most painful journey because he will never let you down. Let's pray. Lord God, from the very beginning, Jesus has been controversial with fans and critics. And yet each one of us has asked the question, the same question, who do you say that I am? And God, today we renew our trust in you. You know, you know the balance of what we believe in our head, what we believe in our heart. And maybe there's some here who've not been able to find that beginning strand of belief at all, but I know that it's there for them. And so, good Lord, for those who are facing storms that you are calming, and for those you are calming in the midst of storms, we ask your grace and assurance that Jesus is Lord over all. In his name we pray. Amen.